I like how you incorporate a lot of animals into your work. Yeah. I like how um, you know you're a, you always use really like really bright colors in everything you do. So it kind of like it kind of counteracts the 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 edge that yeah. your work has, you yeah. know. And so it can be appealing even to like you know even the kids yeah like you see they see that and there's a certain like childlike you know quality to it or, or something that appeals to, to children yeah, like the, that the colors yeah I mean love doing the colors different colors and stuff and I mean I think that's one of the things that people always like like to like about my work is that my choice of colors because I don't really do like you know detailed realistic photographic looking type stuff when I think you it comes from graffiti style stuff a lot. Yeah. Well, that's what I was gonna ask. When you were back in in Reston, like, did you get started in sort of like, I don't know, public art or putting yourself out there as an artist by doing graffiti? I mean, so not too much, really. I mean, not really. But I, I mean, there was people I liked, I looked up to. There was a guy named Jerry Ketterer, and he did a like incredible graffiti from like when we were in high school like like world class basically and I remember there's a piece um, over near um, I forget the name of the, the neighborhood but it's like uh, right up the hill from Hunters Wood Shopping Center mm -hmm. and there was a there was a tennis courts and like basketball courts or whatever but then they had one of those walls where you play tennis against the wall Cold Snack maybe it was Cold Snack um, yeah right up the hill there kind of across from um, Stonegate and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But there was one of those walls where he played tennis against the wall, and he did a piece on one side of that thing. It was incredible. And my jaw dropped. I was like, oh, my God, he did that. So yeah. Was he your age? Was he he's a couple years older. Was like I think he's like a year, maybe two years older, something like that. But somebody that you kind of, like, saw doing it, like... I mean, I never saw him paint, but, yeah, I, I knew him. Yeah. But my, my memory from him is Shadowwood Jumps. You ever hear about Shadowwood Jumps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... We used to race there, and I was not that good at BMX, but uh, one time we were racing, and there's a berm, you know, the berms, the curved parts, and I'm on, on the bottom of the berm, he's riding on the top of the berm, passing me. <laughs> he was a killer, man. I was like, damn, dude, there goes Jerry. And, yeah. Sounds sounds like somebody who didn't have a lot of fear. Yeah, I don't know. I guess, yeah. I mean, to just yeah. like... Yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much there. You know, to be, to be out tagging like that, I think, takes... Uh, it takes somebody that's not scared, not yeah. scared of getting like busted especially, by the cops. Yeah, or, especially if you're considering it's in the '80s when he was doing this graffiti. When now it's you know people, a lot of people love it. Some people don't like it, but. So were you uh, were you born and raised in Reston? So I was born in um, South Boston, Virginia, um, which is like right near the border uh, of North Carolina border, kind of near Danville. And so I lived there for four years, and then we moved to Reston in 1976 when I moved there. That's when I was born. Okay. That's a, that's. That's when I started, or moved to Reston, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when did you start getting into, like, art and music? So, you know, I started getting into music, I guess, uh, probably, like, elementary school, really, like, breakdance music and stuff, or going to the skating rink, the, the skateway, yeah. over near the bowling alley. <laughs> and so, like, there was flippers, the bowling alley with the video games, then there's the skateway, and um, so we go to the skateway... And go roller skating or going there's a center in the middle of there and you stand in the middle and like break dance and stuff and listen to music and and as it turns out one of my friends older brothers was the DJ back then do you, do you know uh, keep, uh, keep going my you know, Vang Ben whatever you know, yeah whatever. yeah so his older brother Ruben was the DJ at the skateway which I learned later and so I'd be like listening to some uh, Sugar Hill Gang some Nucleus um, Beat Street Breakdown, you know, Melly Mel, Fierce I remember Five, all that, all that shit, stuff, yeah. and, and his brother's the one playing that stuff, which I just found out like years and years later. Too, because uh, you can't let the streets beat you. Uh. Well, a picture can express a thousand. 
thousand words to describe all the beauty of life you get. And if the world was yours to do over, I know you'd paint a better place to live. Where the colors would swirl and the boys and girls can grow in peace and harmony. And where murals stand on walls so grand as far as the eyes are able to see. I never knew art till I saw your face that there'll never be one to take your place. Cause each and every time you touch a spray paint can, Michelangelo's soul controls your hands. Then serenades of blue and red. Your head, crescendo colors, playing tune, man. Why oh why did have to die so soon? Say it one, two, three, four. I just let me know what you came here for and just clap your hands, everybody. Yeah. So could could you break dance? Could you do I mean like... I could pop and lock, I can like uh I could do a backspin but not very well. I could do the worm a little bit, but I mean like I couldn't really do too much. I, I did a suicide a few times, you know what I'm talking about, or you just do a flip and land on your back on the ground. <laughs> yeah, it's not really smart. I mean, oh, damn. I think the one time that I really hurt myself. You ever seen when somebody tries to jump in the air and turn around and land and do the worm? Yeah. Why well, did I try yeah. to do that at the skateway? And uh, I did that, and when I did it, my back bent funny. I was like, uh huh, and I didn't do the worm. I kind of crunched and fell over, and uh, it was painful. It was painful. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the skateway. Yep, skateway music, and then uh, I guess kind of from breakdance music, I kind of kind of got into like classic rock a little bit. And um, and actually, my dad. Do you have uh, any siblings? Do you have? Like, I have an older brother and a younger sister. Okay. Yeah, my brother's two and a half years older, and my sister is about twelve years younger than me. Was he bringing music into the house, like too? My brother was. Oh. Yeah, my brother played oh. guitar, electric guitar. So he was like the classic rocker. He played cello in the orchestra, and then could play guitar, electric and acoustic. And so he would play songs, you know. And uh, so he was kind of more like the like the classic rock kind of heavy metal glam rock sort of you know and uh so i learned about some of that kind of stuff like iron maiden from him maybe or you know led zeppelin or that kind of that kind of genre that towards that direction you know and uh i, mean, I got my first reggae album from my dad he had bob marley and whalers live and i was like that's cool was like what's this dad and he's like hey here you can have it son i was like cool thanks man <laughs> so i started listening to bob marley and that was like seventh grade when he gave me that yeah i mean i i kind of found out about most of the stuff on my own too i guess like i had like like there's a couple of people that used to feed me like mixtapes and stuff like Pat Kennedy and Dave Gilligan, um, and then my friend Terry Marquez or Terry Marquez moved from California to Reston, so he had like the little California hookup. His his uh, stepmom worked for um, Metal Blade Records slash Records or something like that, and so he's always had all this different stuff going on. And his dad was like an artist who did stuff out here in California, and so he had some interesting stuff that I learned. But I mean, I guess uh, you know, for me, like the music basically kicked in, you know. Um, went to my first show in D.C. with Pat Kennedy and Dave Gilligan, who were, um, they were in a band called Remission together and Knothead, I think. And then uh, Pat was also the singer for Hostile Environment. And, um, but, um, so like we went to this show, it was a Sunday matinee at the, at the Hung Jury Pub. And it was supposed to be um, uh, Reagan Youth, Government Issue, and, um, man, what was the other band? It's the only band that we got to see was the first band. Um, now I can't remember their name. It was like an old DC skinhead band. Um, and I didn't really like them. Immoral Discipline. I didn't even really like that band that much. But we went to the show. This guy, Mike, put me on. I had a, I actually had a cast on my ankle, I think, from breaking my ankle. So um, this guy, Mike, put me on the show and took me in the pit over on his shoulders, you know, with a cast on my leg. How hey, old were you guys? I think that? I was 14, I think. I think we were 14. And, like, were you familiar with, with government issue or no, like I mean, any I, of these other not bands really, at no. that time not really no so who who knew of like this I think show pat, and... i think pat kennedy okay yeah pat kennedy or dave gilligan but then I had, I had other people that like taught me about music too like a little bit like uh, my my old my friend since like second grade um you mentioned sunrise valley he went there for a while sean joiner mm -hmm. but um, his older brother tom was like into the dc punk stuff his older brother tom was the first one i knew that a tattoo he had like a misfits tattoo like the size of a quarter on his arm I was like oh that's cool you know <laughs> But um, so his older brother had some of the, some records that we would listen to, you know, um, like uh, Necros and stuff like that.
Where's the line go? Such a boss in his face Put the bag from the ring What what was it that kind of turned you on to to punk rock? Or? I mean, I I guess maybe that I, I, I mean people say all this stuff sounds negative and angry, but it, it's like positive for me. I mean, honestly, like I used to listen to that stuff and go to sleep, go to listen, do my homework, anything, you know, everything. And so, like, I mean, so I went to that show in D.C. and. I guess people were making bands, starting bands. I don't know when everything started exactly, but I know Hostile Environment was in existence in ninth grade, and so was LDK. And my parents went out of town. I had a show at my house. So, <laughs> so uh, a, another person from um, uh, Reston named Susan Medville had a show, like a birthday party. Hey, I'm gonna have a birthday party, some cake, you know, parents and bands play. And so I was like, that sounds cool. And I didn't, I didn't go. I wasn't invited. So. And I was like, I knew my parents were going out of town like a couple weeks later. I was like, hey, you guys want to have a show at my house? They're going to be gone. They're like, yes. So all of a sudden, <laughs> oh, trust me, it's like a you know townhouse right above Lake Throw Pool and Winter Pool Cluster. And uh, we took all the furniture out of the, the, the room. I mean, it wasn't a gigantic room, but we put it in the storage room. Um, and we put furniture on the stairway going to the upstairs so people can go upstairs. And my brother's room was down there. We just locked that and put stuff in front of that. But, I mean, the band set up and played and... We actually recorded it. There's audio of it still with my boombox. And I met a lot of people the first, for the first time that night. And there was like a bunch of adults there. And I didn't know who they were. I mean, think about it. I was like 14 years old basically going, hey, let's have a punk rock show. And I mean, we caved in the, the drywall between the two by fours from having a pit in there. I mean, like between four sets of two by fours on both sides. I mean, we destroyed <laughs> it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but I mean, it was a lot of fun. I mean, that. I guess I like going to the pit, you know. Somebody's getting out, getting out that aggression, that energy that way. And then, uh, you know, um, stage diving was fun. Hey, jumping into a crowd of people, you know, and um, that was always fun. Of course, I don't do that now. I'm too big, but I still, I still dance in the pit and stuff. But I mean, the lyrics, you know, uh, the tempo, the fastness of the music, you know. Um, but a lot of times for me, it's the lyrics, you know. I mean. You could have a cool sounding band, but if the lyrics are terrible, I don't know, man. That's not, I don't know. And I, I can't, well, back then I didn't really think about how gifted my friends were. If you think about it, all those people writing music back then and writing lyrics back then were like basically children. And now I look back, I'm like, how did they do that? Seriously, how, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, God gave them these gifts and they, they killed it, you know? <laughs> Was that the first time that you had seen them play? Was that party at your house? 
I, I, that's the first time I saw LDK play, I think, yeah. That's the first time anybody in wrestling saw them play, except for at Susan Medville's house, except for practice space. There was never a show in wrestling before that. What What was your thoughts uh, about seeing them? I mean, I loved Andy it. Andy. Yeah, and, I loved it. It was and, great. And I mean, I knew it. those. I mean, I knew them, but I'd never seen them play. And uh, and having a house environment, I've been to their practice before, but I'd never seen them play in front of people, you know, not with a pit, you know. It was great. I think the... I mean, I was just kind of surprised, like, what happened. And I didn't really know it was going to happen. There was a lot of people there, and it was just crazy, you know. And, I, and looking back, I'm surprised the police didn't come. They pretty much broke up every other party in I mean, Reston that was yeah, any good I mean, like that. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, they would, they, would, they would stop shows sometimes, you know. I mean, so. Well, maybe it would have been for the best, because then your house wouldn't have gotten No, it. no, that's a bad idea. That's terrible. That's a bad idea. No, it was actually for the best that it did happen. It was the best for that did happen. And, uh, you know, um, I mean, you know, the music for me, like, it's lyrics. I mean, it's people coming from different places. It's, you know, um, I guess it's the, the, the awareness that, the, that the, the lyrics give you, too, because, you know, I mean, if you listen to some of the old lyrics from a lot of these bands and some of the new stuff, too, I guess, I mean... But I mean, if you look like at Seven Seconds or Adolescence or RKL or DRI or Minor Threat, Bad Brains, I mean, Government Issue, Void, Faith, I mean, you can just keep going and going and going. I mean, the lyrics, I mean, they tell a story. I mean, the lyrics each, it's almost like an album is almost like a magazine article with different topics, kind of in a way. Some of these albums, the best ones, I mean, and the different songs will kind of look at different things, you know. They'll, they'll look at, I mean, war, government, corruption, medical stuff, religion, like, I mean, social uh, social distancing. I mean, really, um, social divides. Um, I mean, everything. The, the lyrics kind of take it there. And they also talked a lot about unity, um, um, equality among all kinds of people, you know, whether it's um, um, male, female, um, ethnicity, religion, um, sexual orientation, all these things, they addressed it, you know, they did, and they, they, they threw it out there. Do you think you were aware of that stuff before, or no. did the lyrics make you aware the lyrics of those did. things? The lyrics did. And what was, what was like, your main go-to band, or, like, what was the one that, or the one album that really, like, that you connected to the most? You know, man, like, so, it's so like, I, I can't, Hmm. I mean, I ha I hate to say this, and I really, 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 really hate to say this because I, I love all those bands from back then, you know, and I loved all those guys, and I still do. I got issues with some of them, but I still love them, you know. It's like I'm mad at somebody who I still love them, you know. You know, I'd, I'd like to have a serious conversation with them in person, you know, and, and, and have people be able to sit there and have a conversation about it and maybe get shitty and say mean things, but be grown and be like, cool. Oh, by the way, did you see the guy dying in the corner outside? What are we going to do about that? You know, did you see? Did you see the children who are starving and only eat at school? What are we gonna do about that? Me and you were cool, even though it pissed me off sometimes. You know, it's the kind of a conversation I would like to have. But, um, um, you know, I, and it's kind of it's kind of comedic. This this is what I'm gonna tell you because I mean, a lot of the bands were so good. I mean, Transilience technically and and progression wise and instrumentally great. You know, Avail great. You know, with Brian Stewart singing, then with Tim Barry singing. I mean, Dave Gilligan was a singer for a minute, too, you know, with Pat Kennedy playing bass. Um, I mean, but Avail killed it, you know. Uh, uh, LDK killed it. Hostile Environment killed it. Doubt killed it. Um, uh, but, I mean, like, I mean, I can't, I can't really focus on all that stuff, but I would tell you, Psychotic Symptoms demo. <laughs> I can't, I, I'm sorry, dude, but some about that shit. I mean... Craig Mathis when he hit the cowbell, like I was like, what what's that? You know, the only okay, so Craig Mathis had a cowbell, tuk, 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 and be like, oh that's cool, and he would hit it right in the right spot, and then uh, Tim Barry had a China type symbol when he played um uh, in a veil, like it had a little, it's different than a regular symbol, you know what China type is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's kind of so between Tim's China type and Craig's cowbell, I was like that's kind of different, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, I mean think about. We are the living, the living dead. We're here to eat your brains. Toxic waste has woken us up. We're in a frenzied rage. I mean, it's kind of like Keith was making some stupid shit up, but he was also kind of speaking, I think, metaphorically as well, you know? I don't know. They had, they just had like, weird stuff about, like, zombies and, like, just strange stuff, you know? I, I don't know. But, I mean, I loved all that stuff. I mean, Hoss Environment was great, you know? I loved all that stuff, you know? And all the lyrics. I mean, LDK. 
I mean, yeah, I mean, all that stuff, you know? And the funny thing is, is like when you start listening to those guys talk to each other about stuff, be like, yeah, like for LDK, people would say, Craig Harmison stole all his music from Boston. Like he stole his riffs and stuff, or from like Russian Boston, or something like that, or I don't know, or maybe, maybe, uh, who else was it? I don't know, there's some other stuff that people say he, stole, st he would steal his riffs from. I don't know, but I, I could never tell that. You know, those people couldn't tell that stuff, but, um, I remember one time I traded. There, there's somewhat of a of a classic rock yeah. influence to, to yeah. his playing. Yeah, I can yeah. hear that. I don't yeah. know about Boston. Yeah. Oh, but but so one time, one time, so RKL Craig loved RKL Craig Harmison from LDK loved RKL. It seems like everybody loved RKL. Uh, so so I had RKL um, uh, Rock and Roll Nightmare on vinyl with a comic book that came with it, and Craig couldn't find it for years. And when he found that I had it, he's like, "Dude, I'm gonna trade you my Oxblood." 14 whole ox bloods and my whole record collection for that one record. I was like, <laughs> I was like, Craig, you don't want to do that. <clears throat> and we talked a bit about it for a little bit. And then I was like, okay, man, if you want. He goes, he goes, but I got to be able to keep my Boston records. And I was like, okay, <laughs> whatever, man. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. So that's what I'm getting at. So the whole thing. Yeah. To that's that. what I'm getting at. It, it, it's something to it, yeah. Um, but I mean, like, I'm more of a Chicago guy myself. Yeah, yeah. It's four three two five zero one with a yeah Chicago, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I like, I, I like uh, a lot of the DC bands, but I mean, I think it was kind of cool to just kind of see where other bands were coming from too, you know? Because like, I mean, I guess the unique thing was is that we could go to the Nine Thirty Club or the DC Space or the Safari Club, um, Hong Jury Pub, and there was a couple other places I think too. There was like uh, the Merrifield Community Center. Um, course we had the jam for at the rest of community center the first one was at the herndon community center we also had one at um south lakes high school in the, in the stadium um but it's like uh i don't know man there was something about being at like you know 15 years old and going into the city and seeing bands play at night too that was kind of strange you know with the all ages shows so i guess i guess amazing that we were able to do that yeah yeah incredibly amazing and uh i think i think the main thing is is like just just the messages, you know, and I guess like, uh, I don't know, I guess maybe in a, in a way sometimes I feel like uh, I wasn't taught so much by people that were in my life that were my parents or like adults that were in my life teaching me serious stuff. It was more like, yeah, go to school, get good grades, chill out, have fun, cool, see you later, have, you know, here's some food and go to the pool and okay, you know, you know, ask permission for stuff. But but like, I guess, I guess these young people who were writing these lyrics were actually thinking about stuff quite deeply, you know, and uh, and I guess DC is one of the, the hearts of where hardcore came from, and so like, you know, these guys they're 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 living in DC, the capital of the country, and and they're basically like uh, analyzing the shit probably that their parents are doing for work, or <laughs> their friends' parents are doing for work, yeah, and they're saying, okay, here's some of these problems we need to fix it, you know, and, and to my mind that's where it came from, and then like. Uh, you know, you start getting into the New York stuff. There's a little more tougher, more more about the street life rather than about like social issues. Maybe I mean it's still kind of the same thing. Um, you know, I don't different know. perspective yeah. on it. I mean, I guess I guess the funnest thing too was just bonding with your friends. You know, let's go to this, see these bands play. I mean, and seeing and what I like to do is like think about what I saw back then, and now I'll think about some of those bands that are bigger now. You know. Like um like I saw a Public Enemy play at the old nine thirty club in nineteen eighty nine. I mean yeah. the old nine thirty club is small, you know. Ninety eight, that was my favorite one. That suckers to the side, I know you hate my ninety eight. But you, you get, get in it, sure. but you start getting into it and, and public enemy got real political, they they got real social and political. It, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, I I memorized that entire album. Mm -hmm. Sometimes didn't even know what I was what I was saying. I was so young. Yeah. But yeah. like as I grew with it, yep. I, you know, yep. I discovered all these things about the lyrics and went and like went back and researched some yeah. of the stuff that I was listening to and what Chuck was talking about. Yep. You know, I mean, that was the thing we had to actually, you know, we didn't have the Internet or like all recorded human history at the touch of a yep. phone. We had to yep. actually, you know, go yep. to the library. And yeah. Some yeah, stuff man. Out. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, so like, and like, I guess kind of, it's kind of almost like I could think of like this too, like like the DC versus New York hardcore, where DC was more like maybe social commentary, and New York was more like street commentary. I mean, if you want to flip it to like to the rap scene, you can see like a 
Public Enemy is more like that social academic commentary, and NWA is more that street hardcore commentary, almost like uh, maybe like a Minor Threat versus Cro Mags or something like that versus Public Enemy versus NWA. I don't know. Well, there's that. There's also the thing of like the the California yep. bands, like the West Coast yep. bands in yeah, in hardcore, the yeah. the West Coast yeah. versus the, yeah. the East Coast yeah. Yeah. hardcore. It's yeah. a totally different thing too. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Like a, uh, you know, like a. Uh, I mean, it was good. whenever a band would come. I mean, I got to see back in the day. I saw Adolescence. I saw Circle Jerks. I saw Seven Seconds. Um, I and they, they're not from. They're not West Coast, but I saw Gangrene. Um, I GBH, The Accused. But like, um, I saw. I, I don't think I ever saw um, Youth Brigade. Like the Youth Brigade that's from California. Yeah. Yes, California mixed with like Canadians or something like that. Mm-hmm. But that album, Sound and the Fury. That's a great album, and like they kind of the the song uh, Men in Blue, they kind of blended that hardcore music with the rap style. You know, if you are you familiar with that song? I I more know the other Youth Brigade. Okay, stuff so DC Youth than, Brigade, yeah, yeah, better than the yeah. West Coast Youth well, Brigade. Well, the, the album called Sound of Fury that's got a really cool drawing on the front. It's a cool cool album cover and everything, and like uh, and they've got different pressings. You know, people get all weird about their pressings and like, oh, that's only third pressing. Oh, you know, <laughs> but but um. Yeah, I mean, when I when I sing acapella or sing like just make sing sing stuff, I'll sing that one part of their song, and it's like it's straight up like, it's 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 good. The rap part, it's easy, you know. Well, I walked down the street just the other day, and the cops hit me up something I didn't say. There was no reason, there was no rhyme, they just fucked with me to waste some time. It's a scary thing that could waste me. The cops have the power and the gun, don't you see? Simple as the books say in school. You're just not cool if you don't follow their rules. I would have understand if I committed a crime. They could have locked me up, but would have done my time. Well, I didn't do nothing, the man had said. So he jacked me up and he cracked my head. We could bitch all night and we could complain. But it ain't gonna stop till we break our chain. Story and it ended just begun. And we'll be back real soon. It was Run DMC and Aerosmith. They kind of blended rock with rap, but but I guess that's not really what, you know the same thing. But you know, I I think uh, I did. I guess really going to the pit was something too. You know, for me, you know, because I mean I was kind of an academic kid. You know, like I didn't really play sports. I skateboarded. I wanted to play football, but I wasn't allowed. I played <laughs> soccer as a kid, like everybody in Reston. You know. And then as I got older, I'd have to go to my dad's house on the weekend and stay and then be at my mom's during the week. So that kind of ended soccer eventually. Um, but skateboarding so your was... your parents were divorced? Yeah, my parents divorced when I was like about, I guess about seven years old. Yeah. And then my, so my dad moved to D.C. Then he moved back to Reston. He lived over in Lake A.M. And then he moved to um, Leesburg and then he moved out to Lovettsville. He had a farm out in Lovettsville with I think about eight acres. Which we, we actually had a show out there one weekend. <laughs> out there. And uh, it's very entertaining. Um... Do you ever hear of an old metal band from the DC area called Deceased? They yeah, still play? Yeah, so, yeah. So Deceased and some other people were playing out there and stuff. And Deceased wanted to beat up someone named Jay Richardson from um, from Reston. And they were chasing around the farm. I mean, there's horses here. Like, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and it got so ridiculous that my stepmom got mad at my dad and left with my little sister. They're like, we're out of here. This is crazy. You know, you, you have like, you know, probably like 70 or 80, like, punk rockers and metalheads at your farm in the middle of the country out in Lovettsville, you know? That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, we, put, we actually put plywood down for the drums to be on the plywood. I mean, like in the field. I mean, like, and uh, the acoustics were terrible. We had fun. There you was know? no barn to play. There was a barn, but there was, there was horses in there. Horse <laughs> stuff. I mean, we can't play in the barn. But I mean, Skip it was a, shit well, out of the horses. Well, it was a smaller barn. It wasn't that big, you know. I mean, it wasn't a big farm, but, but, uh, but yeah, um, these these guys, the guys from Deceased, were chasing Jay Richardson. My dad's like, guys, can you just not fight here? Just calm down. And I think it was King or. I think it was King from Deceased. He was like, okay, yes, sir, we'll stop. We'll get you later, Jay, you know, or something like that. But, you know, it's like, whatever. Yeah, he's he's from Reston, right? Jay? Yep. No, King. Oh, King. Or is I don't he know. from Herndon? I'm not or sure he, where he's, he's from. He's... It's from the area. It's the DMV area. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
I mean, they're kind of like been the forever, legendary yeah. metal band. They've been around forever from the area. Yeah, and LDK played a number of shows with them, and different things happened and stuff. Um, I think there was a, one big show that was um, I think it was uh, where was it? it was out in Sterling or something, or somewhere like near like uh, off of Twenty Eight, but it was like at a weird like community center or something, and they had a show there. And I remember like seeing um, I think it was. Somebody jumped off of like a gigantic, like, like eight feet of speakers, like off the stage, off the top of the speakers, and everybody moved out of the way, and it hit the Ooh. ground. Yeah, I think it was Halle Dunn. I think it was Halle Dunn that jumped <laughs> off that thing. It was terrible. <laughs> it was terrible. I've seen that stuff though. I was recording a negative approach, like a year and a half ago in Richmond, and this 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 little Caucasian dude, maybe like five feet tall, with like three foot long dreadlocks. I'm sitting there videotaping, and the show's going crazy, right? And the dude comes stage diving right at me. Bam! Hits the ground right in front of me. Knocks himself out. I'm looking at him going, is he uh, dead? You know? <laughs> and then his friends dragged him off to the side and he stood up and they brought him back to. And oh, he was back good. in the pit. Yeah. When did you start skating? So, uh, I, I, uh, so my dad moved to Leesburg and uh, my, my friend there had a Veriflex skateboard. So in 1985, I rode his Veriflex skateboard and he was like, oh, this is how you tic-tac and then started tic-tacking and getting my balance and stuff and doing things. And, and then, uh, uh, there was a guy um, in Reston. Uh, I can't remember his name. I can kind of see his face, but but he had a, he had a uh, 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 Kryptonics ripstick that he sold me for like seventy five bucks, and and uh, so that skateboard. I love that skateboard. It had like a, um, it had a skull on the graphics, with like a vulture reaching down, plucking its eyeball out, and, mm -hmm. and it had like um, the wheels were not. They were they had cone shaped on the edges that kind of angled down. And, but it was Kryptonics I had Independence but so I started skating in like 85 and um, we uh, we built a ramp in Leesburg we started building it like a year later in 86 and we built a half pipe it was um, 16 feet wide had 12 feet of flats 8 foot transitions and then uh, one Damn. side was 9 feet tall one side was 10 feet tall so you had like a foot and a half of vert on this side like 2 and a half feet on this side and so I would skate that thing on the weekends but I mean I'd, I'd, I didn't get really that good but my friends who skated every day great so, and I still keep up with my one friend from back in the day, my friend Matt in the skateboard I rode. We were just texting the other day. So, in terms of Jam for Man, like, how, what do you remember in terms of it starting and, like, you, the, the first time you ever heard about it and um, what your experiences were actually, like, personally, yeah. where you were at, at each one of them? So, okay, so Jam for Man, I think the first one, I didn't even know it was happening until it was happening. And, uh, this is the one at Herndon. Herndon, yeah. And so I think somebody was like, well, let's go to the Jam for Man, like, cool. And I, I drove, and I used to drive a lot. And so uh, I'd just pile people in my car and drive. I actually had a, um, a Chevy Citation that I um, stenciled and painted ba band names and stuff on it, painted fire down the, the sides and all this stuff. So, Fuck And yeah. uh, I had, like, a, so the, the Marine Corps recruiters used to come to South Lakes at lunchtime at the high school. And I got a gigantic Marine Corps sticker, and I put it in the back window. And then I took a... Um, this Mickey Mouse cutout I had that goes like this, and then I took the letters like a like a serial serial killer's letter, but it said "Rest in Hardcore" with the Mickey Mouse with his hands out going like this, "Rest in Hardcore." And I had that. I taped it into my window, and like, yeah, we used to have a fun in that thing. We called it the Suicide Citation. <laughs> Suicide <laughs> Citation. But um, yeah, so we drove over to Herndon, and I didn't even know where the, the show was. And somebody, you know, they said to turn here. We went in there, three dollars and a can of food to get in, whatever. And um, you know, so I was like, this is kind of weird, you know, a show in a community center, and like bands are playing and so it was, it was a lot of fun I think it was like um, Sam Gunnarsson and Cactus Drew Cactus Groove I think it was Hostile Environment um, Avail and maybe somebody else I, I don't remember because I don't have a flyer anymore but Domino's Pizza was there I think um, and I think um, Mrs. Worsler mom quote unquote mom mom Mrs. Worsler she was there like announcing somebody else was announcing too um, and uh, yeah it was, it was cool I think um I remember them saying, and next up is Anvil, and that's what it was, Avail. <laughs> but, I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. So the Jam for Man, that first one, I was like, what is this? You know, I think I got a t-shirt, you know, and everything. And then, and then they were like, okay, Jam for Man 2 is coming up. And then I was like, oh, I got to see what's up with this. So I actually went to one or two of the meetings at the community center. We kind of sat at the steps near the pool, if I remember correctly. And Mrs. Worsler talked to the group. Maybe there's another adult there, and we're talking and stuff. And 
you know, it's like um, certain people were there, you know, you know, kind of steering it. And um, and then I, what I really enjoyed doing was, um, so I helped, I think I did some of the flyers and also painted the backdrops that, all the backdrops you saw with all the spray paint behind the bands with the names and all that stuff, I did all those. Um, and so I would just show up early, set up the backdrop, climb on a ladder, you know, just walk around and I thought it was cool because I could go in the room that not everybody could go in there, you know, like go in like eat popcorn or have like water or soda. I don't know what they had in there, but I would take stuff, you know. Um, take, <laughs> take, I basically would take food and and then I, I, I more often than not, I'd have a video camera from um, the video camera class at South Lakes or from somebody. Miss Belt? Would, Miss Belt, yep. And I'd set up on a tripod in the back and, and let it go, you know. And um, and so, I mean, that was the thing. And, and honestly, like, I was also one of the people that I was always kind of riling up the pit, too. Like, when I go to shows, I, I was often the first one to start the pit. And not just in, like, a jam for man, but in, like, D.C., too, like, 930 Club. Because after the first couple bars of the song or something, I'd be so amped up, I'd start jumping around like all cuckoo, you know. And it was fun. And uh, they actually, they, they said I did the funky chicken. So any of the old school people, they'd be like, yeah, man, do the funky chicken. Because I did this thing where I'd actually close my eyes and spin around and do kind of crazy stuff. I don't know what the hell's going on. Um... But it was it was it was fun, you know, and I was enjoying myself, and and people were having fun, and uh, I even we even I even got to sing at one of the shows, it was a Halloween show. It was um I believe it was um Transilience, Doubt, and then us. So we were called um D O S, which this is a uh, Craig Craig Mathis on drums, Jason Browning on guitar, and Terry Marquez on bass. And they were just like, we want you to sing for us, Than. I'm That's like, a good band. Well, they were like, we want you to sing for us, Than. I'm like, I don't know how to sing. They're like, it's cool, man. We got the lyrics and everything. You can just memorize it and just say it. I'm like, okay. And so, so we were like, it was Halloween, right? So who wrote so, the lyrics? You didn't I write know, the lyrics. Terry, Terry, and Jason. Like okay. weird shit. Like they had a song called Tiamat. Tiamat, Mother Terror, bring her up all times. She'll slowly bring you to your death or something. Like I don't know what the hell they were saying. <laughs> I was like, what? Are, and actually, during the show, I forgot most of the lyrics. I just like screamed and mumbled and stuff and like made shit up. And that's the truth, man. Because I was like, I don't know what they told me to say. It's weird, like Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> talk or you know mythology. I don't know. So I don't know. I was like, but they. Uh, so Jason and Terry came on stage with uh, gas masks on and, and sh- lamb's wool, like like a lamb skin on their head. Uh-huh. And I think Craig was wearing something weird. And I actually came out, I took a... My mom, uh, you couldn't buy black clothes back then, like you can now. They, it just was very difficult. So my mom made me a black sweatsuit. Um, I painted a skeleton on it. She also made me a long black cape, believe it or not. And then I had a jack-o'-lantern on my head. I carved it, put it on my head. So we came on stage, and people were like, what? And then I basically pulled my hood down, pulled the jack-o'-lantern arm from my head, and threw it at everybody, and then I had my face painted like a, a skull. And then we played our show. Probably played like five songs. Nothing, really. Pushing the buttons, hitting the keys. Relaxation in the cool summer breeze. Ice water chills, school fire drills. Turn 21 and it's all the swim. shows I mean there used to be a lot of people at these things like I, I would say like 300 people maybe I mean lots of people I mean some of the biggest pits I've seen in my life were at Jam for Man shows honestly really I mean like and crazy it was crazy and like girls boys everybody you know kids adults well maybe not so many adults but it was, it, was, it was a strange time because kids could go outside and smoke in the courtyard at the community center you know yeah but now you have to be over 18 I mean back then they would sell cigarettes to children too you know so it's a strange thing but but I mean, but we had Domino's Pizza there. So I was kind. Of, I, I think another thing I gained was from that I learned that okay, you can do things for other people without expecting them to pay you. It's like volunteering, but it was a different kind of volunteering. It was like volunteering, but on your own terms. And so the homeless folks at the shelter, um, Rucker, Embry Center, Rucker, Embry, yeah. they benefited from it. But those people had no idea what these kids were doing, which were us. We were kids. Yeah. And and there were a few organizers and leaders in the group, but I mean, everybody took their part. Everybody did their part. You know what I mean? And uh, it was good, and and I think it showed an example to adults that okay, these weird kids like mohawks and whatever they're doing in their in their pastimes, we might not agree with, but in the end of it, at the end of the day, they're coming together and doing something that our community leaders aren't doing for these people. 
I mean, I never heard of a benefits for the homeless shelter. Whose but, idea was that? Like, do you remember? Who so, was? so specifically, from what I understand, um, the people who started Jam for Man were Joe Banks and Brian Stewart, I believe. I mean, is that what you've heard? And yeah, maybe, I pretty much. And, and, and maybe, and maybe Mikey Worsler, who was also in avail at the time, because his mom was the one who was kind of organizing. But who were? Who were they socially conscious enough to, to think of it that way? Like, we're going to do this I as, guess. Like, I mean, as, I mean, a, as a benefit? Or I mean, was I, that one so, person? Like, that seems like a Brian kind of thing. Yeah, but. I mean, so, so there was also there was Positive Force, I think, was had started in D.C., Positive Force. And I think they were doing benefits for things. And there was, like, I think Food for Thought might have been around back then, the D.C. place. So I think there were other leaders who were teaching this, you know, that – people were learning from I mean I don't know maybe Brian and Joe thought of it or whoever thought of it on their own but maybe it was not on their own I don't know who came with the idea exactly I know though a lot of people pitched in and threw in you know a lot of people got into it you know all the musicians loved playing those things loved it Fucking, they loved that you know and 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 all the people who, who weren't in bands they loved going there because they didn't have they couldn't have that opportunity I mean when I said I went to my first show in DC when I was 14 most people aren't going to let their kids go into D.C. to see bands play at that age. So they could go to the community center, which is a safe environment primarily. You know, um, you know, your parents could drop you off. They could come back and pick you up. It was for kids. It was kids doing it. That's what it and was a positive for me. message. I mean, there were some, you know, adults there too. But so it's like, I don't know. I think it set an example. Um, you know, kind of, it kind of said the whole don't judge book by its cover type thing maybe. But, um, but I mean, for Jam for Mans for me, it's like basically it's like I like to go early see what everybody's doing, what the, what the order of the show is, put my backdrop up, and then wait for the bands to play and just throw down. Literally, just like, Phew, let's go. And how long did you keep going to jam for bands? Like, so, when was the last one that you I think remember? the last one I went to was the one at the stadium, maybe, in the South Lake Stadium. And that one had a low turnout, but I honestly do believe it's because it was hot out and it was sunny and... I mean, I think that's. Pr- I mean, there was people there. Maybe, maybe there was people there, but it's such a. It's a st- the, the the football stadium, so maybe it just seemed like there wasn't a lot of people mm-hmm. there. I don't know, but I think that's the last one I went to. And I don't even was that four. That was Jam four. for Man four. Yeah, so that's the last one I went to. I think Jam four. Yeah, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that, actually, actually, that's a, the last one I went to was last summer, <laughs> which was you, man. Yeah. yeah well, yeah, I yeah. I remember you in oh, that yeah, one too. Yeah. And I remember you basically starting, you know, starting the pit or oh. at least the dance floor. I, would there. Kind of, I mean, like, honestly, if I wasn't videotaping, I would have been moving around more. But I was videotaping. Yeah, but and even it, videotaping, you were you were moving around, you were getting down. And, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I do that shit. Yeah. And and you were doing um, like flyers for all of the the jam for I, I did. Like also, I did a or? few. I did a few of those types of things. Um, you know, I think the person who did the best flyers for jam for me was Dave Gilligan. He he, man. He he was he really had a mind for like, like a focal point and like re reconstructing the band names really nicely and like you know redrawing them and like he was he, really good with lettering. Yeah, really also. good lettering. Kind of like he kind of he kind of understood graphic design without taking graphic design and without having like a, a computer that could do all that for him. You know, he he had a real good idea for for that kind of layout. Did you do any album covers too? No, I did not. I did not. I did one for my friend's band recently, though. Um, he put it on a, a cassette cover for this band, Exit the Beast, out of Richmond. But no, I never did that stuff. I did. I remember one time. So, so what I was trying to think of just now was um, one time Craig Harmison and Guamper came to my house at like two in the morning on like a school night. They're like, "Come on, we gotta go to Kinko's and make a flyer for the show." I'm like, "What? You guys need to leave me alone. It's a school night. Come on, we're going." I'm like, "Oh my god!" So we got in Craig's car and he drove us over to um the Kinko's, the 24 hour Kinko's over at George Mason. Kind of yeah. where there's a there's a club there for a little while named Fat Tuesday. I don't know if it's still there, but so we, we I basically stood at the Kinko's countertop for like four hours or like three or four hours drawing this one flyer. It was a it was actually um it was um in Destroy LDK and Deceased at the at the Safari Club. Nice. And I think that maybe for some reason I feel like that show either that show happened and the one in Sterling happened. Where I told you someone jumped off the PA from way up and landed on the ground. I think that was uh-huh. highly done, but or or that show at the Safari Club got canceled because Safari Club closed and they moved it to Sterling. I forget exactly, but yeah, they, they pulled me out for that flyer that time. And and the other thing I was trying to get at, um, what I was trying to think earlier was um, so Dave Gilligan did not. I don't know if we ever did take our classes together. Maybe we did in eighth grade at Langston Hughes, but 
I will tell you, I was at Pat Kennedy's house. Me and him slept over at Pat Kennedy's house one weekend, and it was either the night before we fell asleep or the next day. He drew the, the hostile environment symbol, I think, that day. Mm. And he drew a hand like this, and then drew the symbol on the hand right there. Yeah. And that was the symbol. That was the cover for the cassette tape. Yep. So, yeah. That cover's cool. Yeah. So it's the remission cover. Like, he did he did yeah. really good covers. Yeah, he, Dave was a great artist. I haven't seen him in, like, many, many, many years. Many years. The last time I saw him, he was going, like, look at this. I developed my own, I'm developing my own fonts. And he had, like, a drawing book. And I keep drawing books, too. But, and he basically had the alphabet written a bunch of different letter styles. And I'm like, oh, cool. I don't know if you listened to the episode that um, that we did together. No, I have but not. But so I got a chance to talk to him. Yeah, yeah. And that that was really cool. Cool, cool. And like, you know, all along he he has continued to 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 be artistic and to 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 make great stuff. I mean, he's doing yeah. a lot of writing now. Okay. And he's made music like all yeah. along okay. during that whole time. I just don't think I don't think he's done as much of like putting his art out there yeah. as he d- like like actual visual yeah. art. But you know, the last time I saw him, he was like, "I'm living in a cabin in like I think it was like New Mexico. His rent was like eighty dollars or something or something ridiculous." And he's like, "He's like, and we just made dirigeridoos the other night, traditional, <laughs> they're, they're burning the embers through them." I'm like, "Cool, man! Like, it must have taken forever." You know. Yeah. Strange how you lose track of people, you know, even like you were tight back in the day. I remember being in a pit with him and uh, him and Pat Kennedy at Warzone at the West Music Hall, which is now the 930 Club. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, um, the, they had the song Always, I'm There, If You Want, Always a Friend for Life, and we had our arms locked, three of us in the pit as little kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Uh, that, that's great. Yeah. So did your art kind of career or, you know, what – you were doing with with visual arts did that take off mainly after art school was that so i didn't go to art school i studied my degrees in anthropology and sociology um so um and i graduated well i guess you had you were doing film yeah so so i did some film work um and when i was there i worked on a few and you say cartooning uh, yeah yeah i did a cartoon it's like a minute long it's my little sister's voice when she was in third grade it's called turkey worm she had to do a project for school and i was in animation class and i read it It was on the refrigerator at their house i said and my dad and my stepmom so I said hey do you want to make a cartoon out of this she said sure so about a year later the cartoon was done it was about I think it was like 550 drawings for like a minute and is this on YouTube yeah it's on YouTube it's on my channel it's the nice. first thing on my channel okay yeah, yeah. and uh but uh so like uh um what were we talking about we were saying like after after oh, yeah, VCU art, yeah. so, so VCU so after VCU um I kind of uh moved more into like skateboarding and just going to see bands play and and uh, you know um, a lot of different stuff like that, uh, and uh, so basically um, I didn't do too much art. I mean, I did some art, you know. And I started collecting things out of alleyways. I was gonna make like, alleyway art, and you know I was doing drawing and stuff. And I do little projects. Like I sometimes I like make like get an exacto knife and cut out construction paper and like make holiday cards, make like thirty cards and send them out to people, one of a kind, and or something. But I never really like pushed it to the full limits, one hundred percent. And then I guess at some point in there. Um, I kind of moved into making button-down shirts, and so I, was, I made about a hundred button-down shirts, men's button-down shirts. Yeah, I've seen some of those yeah, online. And, and so, like, so I was doing that for about ten years, and then I also made some dresses because people were like, oh, you got to make dresses. That's where the money is. I could never figure out how to make the business part of it out. I'm not good at uh, selling my art. I, I can make art all day. I'm not good at the the business side of it. But um, so I made these shirts for like all this time and then I couldn't figure out how to really make it lucrative. So I stopped. I kind of took a break on it. I made a couple t-shirt quilts at the time too. Um, you know, take old band shirts and cut them into squares and, you know, make quilts with, uh, with um, uh, different parts of it. But so sewing was a big part of it. I mean, so they, you were actually doing all the physical sewing machines? Yeah, yourself? sewing machines. Yeah, my mom had a couple sewing machines. And um, yeah, do the straight stitches, buttonholes, um, serge the edges. So it's professional. Some of these shirts I made in like nineteen in the 1990s, people still have them today and wear them today. They're still good quality. Your mom taught you how to do that? Or? Yeah, yeah. I'm the, um, so my family goes back to, um, they came to this country a little over 100 years ago from Germany on her side. And they've been sewing ever since they've been in this country. And so my grandfather sewed. So back at least four generations that I know of we've been sewing so my grandfather worked at the post office and my grandmother did sewing on the side to make money for the family so but yeah i learned how to sew so it's cool that you're carrying on that well family tradition well how it started andy was um so 
in seventh grade, I wanted jams. You know, hey, jams are cool. They're cool designs. You know, cool. Mom's like, I'm not paying twenty five dollars for that. <laughs> well, she's like, we'll go to buy the fabric at the store. You can pick whatever you want, and you can make them. And so that's how I learned to sew was by making basically making jams, drawstring shorts. And then I made some pants. And then I took a break from that stuff forever. And then uh, I'd say it was around 1995. I think I made myself one or two shirts, and then Sam Gunderson wanted a shirt, if you know Sam. Yeah. And Sam was sweat me and sweat me and sweat me. And, and I, that, I've had Sam on the well, show, too. His shirt is one of the coolest shirts I've ever made. It's got a sun design with all these different kinds of fabric on the back that kind of come out in different color schemes. To It came out really, really nice. Um, and then it kind of progressed from there. Oh, can you make me one? Can you make me one? And, and, and basically, I'd just give them away, usually, because... I felt insulted when somebody wanted to give me, you know, forty dollars for a shirt. I'd be like, "You're insulting me, man. The fabric costs that much. Plus five hours, four or five hours of work. Forget it. Just take it. Or go to the store and buy something. It's much easier." But you know, I kind of, I've I've killed myself so many times for doing stuff like that for people. Like, hey, just take it or here, just take it. Because um, if I didn't, I've had a, I'd have a hundred shirts right now of crazy stuff. But it's nice to put it out there, and I enjoy doing that stuff for other people, even though I know they're not doing something back for me. But I know that God will, you know, I mentioned karma earlier, God, whatever. It comes back. So, um, But then so I, I started writing poetry seriously, too, in my early 20s. Um, really probably like around age 21, 22. Um, had some stuff going on in my life where I was kind of really sad and feeling alone. So I started writing, and I stuck with that constantly. And so the writing poetry, really even when everything else kind of slipped a little bit, or, you know, I'd still write poetry constantly. I mean, and then and then I started doing drawings again, and I've thrown away like thousands of poems and lots of drawings too, but I won't do it again. But so, but then so like I've been doing the writing and the drawing and all this stuff for years and keeping it actually. And then my friend uh, Jeremy, did you uh, did you ever put together a, a book of poetry? I don't know that. So seen, like... so yeah, so so Jeremy Frost, okay, Jeremy Frost, who's also from Reston, um, he called me up in 2014, and we used to hang out and stuff like. You know, do stuff and like I visited him in Florida a couple times. We hung out at Mardi Gras in New Orleans at our friend's house down there a couple times. So, you know, we did stuff and he contacted me out of nowhere and was like, Hey, are you still writing? I'm like, Yeah. He's like, Well, you want to put some stuff in and do an arts journal. So he had a thing called Coffee Shop Blues and he was putting that out. And so I go, I go, Well, I wrote some poems about going out to, um, going out to eat lunch, then going back to work. How's that sound? I get, I'll send them all to you. You can put a few of them in your book. He goes, How about I put them all in there? And I had 50 of them. I was like, okay. So, and I called it Luncheon, and I dedicated that section of his book to Rest and VA. So it's Luncheon, whatever. And it's 50 poems about Luncheon. Like, yeah, like, like, you know, hey, you're Luncheon. You uh -huh. know? So I didn't just play on words, you know, because a lot of people don't know what the word Luncheon means if you're not from Reston. No, but like groups, if you're but, from yeah, Reston, yeah. you know. Yeah, so, so I called that Luncheon. And then, I, and then like, I think six months or a year later, he came out with another version, but I could only have artwork in it. He put my art on the cover and then some on the inside. And so, so, um, that and then I was also in a poetry group back in 2005 in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, the Fredericksburg Center for Creative Arts had a poetry group, and we came out with our own book in 2005. And so it was basically myself and a bunch of senior citizens and retired people, and so it was kind of cool. Um, and uh, I'll tell you the craziest thing about that was, and, and I had like retired uh, academics, retired um, just retired folks, and retired physicists. Um, uh, but the, the funniest thing was. Um, uh, this woman, Ann Flythe, right? She's passed on when I was there, Ann Flythe. She was in her 80s then. And we're walking in, I, and I see her walking into the place. She's got her cane in her bag, you know, and I'm walking in from my car. And I go, I go, hey, Miss Flythe, let me let me carry your bag for you. And she goes, oh, sure, Stan, but be careful. My pistol's in there, and it's loaded. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? So I open it up, and I don't know what guns are. What's, I mean, it was a, a big pistol, probably like a 38. And I'm like, if she shot that, it might knock her over. She's, you know, using a cane or break her arm. But I was like, okay, cool. Hilarious. But we came out with a book called Gathering of Poets in 2005, and then I came out in Jeremy's book in 2014, and then he actually put out a book of my poetry um, at the end of 2016 called Light of Love, and uh, then I came out with um, three books at the end of the year last year on Amazon Publishing that I put out myself, um, which is Kindle Direct Publishing is very friendly, user-friendly. Anybody can put out a book these days, but um, so I put out Alms for the Poor, which is um, my friend uh, James, um, James, um, it's his story um, about when he goes to prison as a teenager, and um, it's 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 basically kind of um, very telling of the times right now. It was in the 1980s when he went to prison, but and then uh, basically based upon you know racism and stuff and, and inequality and and and, and in, injustice as far as I could tell, you know. Um, and then he got it gets out of prison and then he goes back in because someone comes to attack him and his cousin with a gun. They defend themselves. The guy gets killed with his own gun. 
He's killed with his own gun, and the witnesses say it was self-defense, but they still send him back to prison for many years. So, so he had a tough time. But it's his story, and then it's my poems. And those poems are basically about um, self-forgiveness, paying it forward, helping others, doing good things, um, you know, finding your place with God, you know, doing good things. So, like, moving forward in, in a positive way and helping other people and helping yourself. And then I also came out with um, New Tree Two Stories, which um, has gone through a couple different versions with the covers and stuff. I just um, came out with a new cover recently, but it's two fictional stories. There's also a letter that I wrote to um, Senators Kane and Warner in there, and um, and a couple other things in there. But but it's basically two fictional stories, and um, so that's kind of a cool book actually for fiction. And then I put out another book of poetry called Insanity, in Sanity. Basically, I mean if you're sane right now, then then you can see that the whole world is insane. Or if you're sane, you're basically insane because you realize what's going on around us. So insanity, basically saying, does that make sense? It's kind of you're in words. sanity. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, basically. So <laughs> yeah. So and in sanity, there is insanity. Yes, and so it's kind of a play on words, but the whole book is basically like that. The poems in there, there's nothing that binds the poems together. They're they're not really rhyme and meter. Most of them, they're just kind of like freestyle craziness. Some of the poems are like two lines. Some of them are like a couple pages. Um, and so that book's over 500 pages of poetry. And then um, and I'm currently trying to figure out some time to format two more novels that I have. So I just got to put those together. I didn't realize you so, were yeah. so prolific on the writing. I mean, I've seen I've seen some of your poetry, but yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, um, Amazon.com, if you look up my full name, Nathaniel Shellhays Vizdos, it's, okay. you look that up. And then uh, I just helped my friend Marty put out his book too. He's a Vietnam veteran. He talks about his time when he was in... And I'll put, I'll put links to all this okay. stuff uh, along with the episode. Oh, cool, cool. He, um, he, he, but he, uh, He's a Vietnam veteran. It talks about his time in, um, I guess, Fort McNair and also Quantico, and then his time in Vietnam War. And um, and it's also when I visited Fredericksburg a couple months back, um, I actually met with him and got a, copies of a lot of his pictures that I still have to add to the book. And he actually wants to add more stories to the book as well. So it's kind of a work in progress, but that's available on, online too. Hmm. And that's Marty Gettler. And actually, the cover is him in Vietnam as a soldier. You know, 50 years ago, whatever. He's got an eagle on his arm. No, no leather glove. No mask on the eagle's face. And so him and his him and his friends there, they ran the war dogs. So they're dealing with psycho animals or whatever, you know, or trained psycho animals, trained killing animals, and uh, or defense animals. But then the, the when the, when the other soldiers came upon a baby eagle from some stuff they were doing, they're like, "Well, give it to these guys." So these guys raised an eagle, like some kind of, I don't know what kind of an eagle it is, but it's an interesting cover picture. And when I first saw the picture, I was like, dude, if we do the book, that's got to be the cover. And so. But um, but yeah, so I've got some writing out. Yep, and I also I basically I basically put out poetry almost every day online too, new stuff. And has uh, has religion always like been a big part of your life? Has that always informed like your your art and you know your outlook, or yeah. is that more of uh, a a new thing for you? So 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 religion has always been a huge part of my life, and so I'm not. I don't really espouse to any one specific religion personally. Um, I think all religions have good and bad in them. You know, part of my part of my youth and, and learning about the world happened to be part of that because my great uncle was a, was a Jesuit missionary who worked in Papua New Guinea. He worked in Puerto Rico and and he baptized me as a baby as a Catholic. And so, um, and his name was Owen, Uncle Owen. And and I was like, dude, he's like a monk and stuff. He's a cool man, you know. So I wanted to be a, the Pope when I got older. When I was a kid, I was like, I want to be the Pope. I'm going to be the Pope. I was like, bam, I want to be the Pope. But then as I started getting older and understanding the dynamics of the church, which we don't need to go into it, but I started being like, nah. And in fact, I don't ever want to go to this church again, honestly. You know, I mean, even the fact that women cannot preach in a Catholic church and that women are kind of second-class citizens in the Catholic church, I don't like that. That's that's just part of it, but I'm not going to go into it too much. But So Catholicism, as soon as I could get out of it, I did. And so, I mean, you picture me, you know, you know, 14, 15 years old, having a mohawk at church, going like this, trying to go to sleep the whole time, <laughs> falling out of the pew, basically. And, you know, when I could, I'd sneak outside and have a cigarette, you know. So, I mean, that's how I was. And so so I stopped doing that, but I was kind of always with God, if that makes any sense, and spiritual, you know. Like, I believed in that. You can talk about the karma. I mean, I also, you know, I, I became very close with Buddhism in my teenage years because I was, I, I had a girlfriend for five years, and she was from Vietnam, and you know, here comes we're Vietnam again. But so her family was very Buddhist, and her grandparents were great. I'd go to their grandparents' house every weekend, 
and, and they live right above Lake Ann Plaza at the, at the old folks home there. And so I would, I would be over there all the time, love those people, and they taught me how to eat different kinds of food, but also they taught me about Buddhism and stuff. And so, and so even at like their, 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 their family events and big events and different things, even at her grandfather's funeral, I was like the, one of the point people because they were like, we videotape our funerals, if you can figure that out. But so they had me videotaping a Buddhist funeral with the monks coming and I prayed with monks in the temple and the place in DC and like, so different things. So I was learning about that. My stepfather was Jewish. So, and he had, and he had family from back in the day who actually sent weapons to Israel for them to take the country of Israel. So, so I had like that Jewish influence. I had Christianity with the Catholic stuff. I had the Buddhism stuff, you know. Um, I didn't learn too much about um, uh, Islam or um, uh, like any other kind of stuff. Even Hinduism, I don't really know too much about that. But, but what I do understand is like still time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. Yeah. And, and there is still time. And and actually, I'm working on getting some other kind of holy books to to look at now. Um. So. But like I mean, like I've always kind of been with God, you know, and I kind of had an understanding about different kinds of positive things, you know, and negative things as well associated with it. I mean, if you look at like um, the uh, the um, what am I thinking of? The, the when the Christians went down to the Middle East and fought the um, the Crusades, they had the Children's Crusade. Hey, we've killed everybody else. Let's send the children to go fight. I mean, it doesn't, you know, or the Spanish Inquisition. So you can start stacking. Never the heard chips. of the Children's. Yeah, they had Crusade. the Children's Crusade. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yeah. Wow. Look that shit up. It's crazy. I will. But um, but so like, but so, but so like, God has always been important to me. But maybe, maybe religion is religion is more. I think for like uh, developing that, and then I think if you can get to a certain point, that God can just be kind of in your life. I mean, honestly, I'll tell you, and you probably you may know this, but I I read the Bible every day, but I read the New Testament primarily. Sometimes I read the Old Testament. And, and I do I do have an affiliation with some some religious leaders and some spiritual leaders and they're my friends you know and and uh, and I do attend church when I can but but honestly like I've met people from all backgrounds that are all good people and I think I just think the important thing is to like to be connected in some way with with the higher power and and I've got one of my best friends doesn't believe in God he says but he meditates and does yoga so even though I I can't attribute what he's doing is to anything else other than God. He just doesn't know it. I mean, that's how I see it. I mean, if you're meditating, you're basically praying, but it's a different kind of thing. Like, I think, like, uh, my opinion of that stuff is, like, um, so, like, like, and some people compare Jesus to Buddha, basically, kind of, but I think, like, Buddha kind of went inside for, for in, internal answers, whereas I think Jesus went to God. But I think they both taught like compassion and love, you know. Um, I don't know, but I, I think the main thing that for me, I think with God, the main thing for me is like when everything else is going spinning out of control, which this world is spinning out of control. You can walk up the block any time of the day and see the world spinning out of control. If I can, I'll just reconnect with God at those points. If I get stressed out, or if I feel intimidated in some way, or I get scared about the world around me, or anything negative, I can always go to God and God, God, you know, God, God, God helps me in that way. You know, and I mean, ain't nothing different about it, you know. And I think, I think uh, the main thing is for me, the main thing for me is to try and figure out why I'm here for God's purpose, you know. I mean, I don't know, man. You've talked to me before. You've heard me get real, real negative real quick, or you've heard me like probably talk really, really fast before and jump subject to subject, which I do regularly. But I'm always trying to figure out why am I here? What's my purpose on this planet? Like, like, I'm not here to, you know, um, make money, which I, I'd love to make a lot of money off my art. But even in the past year and a half, I, I had, I had, I've had many different kind of jobs in my life. And my last job, I was a job coach for basically 12 years. Then I ran a job center for the last year at that company. And I've also taught adult ESL for many years. So teaching people from other countries how to speak English. And so I've seen things from a lot of different aspects and stuff. And I've worked in prisons. I've served on councils for autism and for school-aged children. I've represented my former employer um, in prisons. I've, I've spoke at the first Attorney General's Conference on Reentry in um, Williamsburg in 2016. So a lot of different things. I've, 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 I was served on a council that advised the governor of Virginia on disability issues um, for about a year and a half. And I went to the um, governor's mansion in Richmond when they dedicated the wheelchair ramp, which was long overdue, and I got to hang out in there and like check that out. And, but I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's like, 
why are we here and and what's the point and so like all this music that we're talking about and, and you know we're talking about a lot of different stuff but the lyrics and the music to me that stuff is as much as important from God as the Bible honestly the, the lyrics I mean a lot of the stuff they're talking about is profound and it, and it, and it, it doesn't it's it's not it's not bubblegum stuff you know it's it's not you know well, where do you think it comes from you know it comes from God yeah <laughs> and, and and it's all little pieces and like so like yeah so you asked if it's if if religion is important to me religion yes and God is the most important thing to me I'd say do you think that what you have found out in terms of why you're here is basically that your life is about service? Service, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. In fact, my business cards say "In Service of God" on my business cards, and uh, so service, yeah. And I mean, I did that for for money for years in my last 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 couple jobs, and and then you know, man, like so, I do ask, I do pray and ask, you know, and I pray and ask, and like so when I ask, kind of for a while. Well, I'm supposed to help bring people to God. So people who kind of having tough times or whatever, I'm supposed to try and maybe help if I can. Or maybe not. I mean, maybe I have nothing to do with it. But, but really, I'm supposed to paint and make art. And so I even keep up with my old high school te- uh, principal, one of my best mentors in my life, Dr. Frank Jenkins. And actually, I dedicated my book, I'm Alms for the Poor, to him. And, uh, and we, we were hanging out last summer. I did, a, I did a portrait of his dog, too, for him. You know, So he was nice enough to hire me for that. But, uh, but we hang out, and he, say, he said, you know, Than, I'm really happy for you because your whole life you've done other things for other people constantly. And he knew it back then when I was a kid. I mean, I was, did you know I was one of the um, graduation speakers for my graduation at uh, South Lakes? No. Yeah, there was me and the valedictorian and then, like, the SGA people, yeah. So, yeah. So I got. Did the students choose you or yeah, the faculty they did, chose student, you? the students. Nice. And so, but he said to me, he's like, you've always done other things for other people. I'm glad to see you're finally doing something for yourself. And so. Even now, I've had some folks come along and help me, family members and friends, you know, and, and just kind of just basically give me money when I needed it, which it doesn't hurt them to do it. it I don't live in a place where if somebody helps me out, they're going to be fucking dead and, and starving. They're not, my family's not like that. My, I've got all kinds of people in my family that have been very successful. You know, I'm not saying like, you know, like owning a Walmart, but they're successful military, education, finance, all kinds of things. But um, so it doesn't hurt them when they when they help me, and they have in the past. Um, but really, like what it's I know, it's I hard to, do, to make it as an artist. It is hard to make it as an artist. But what but what I do know is that when I asked, and I asked for a long time, I was told to paint. And so, and honestly, man, like, I mean, you know, I I've learned how to get by no matter what, and God has blessed me in some way or another. And even my recent move to Pittsburgh was a blessing from God. Um, and uh, so, and that's 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 a whole another whole another like wow can't believe that do you think that a lot of that stuff about service started with jam for man <laughs> now i see what you're getting at andy yeah it did it honestly did it did so i'm gonna I'm go real deep for you here okay let's go deep man so jam for man taught me that stuff you know it taught me about helping other people i never even went over to embry rucker center i never even saw any of those people that it benefited but i knew i was doing something good and i saw all of us doing it and you're talking about like the the, the little crazy kids, you know, hey, look, I got a mohawk, I got this, you know, I got I got weird clothes with stuff on them, I'm wearing skulls and monsters before it was cool, like, now you can get monsters and skulls and, like, J.C. Penny and Sears, but back then, you know, you were the psychopath freak if you wore that stuff, like, don't let that you kid were around spooky. here. Yeah, 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 <laughs> spooky, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 so, so, like, uh, you know, I'm, and, and so, then what happened was, I'm gonna take it there, man, um, I, I, I hadn't slept for days and days and days, and I ended up in the hospital a couple different times. And so what I've come to realize is that when people don't sleep for days and days, you're going to be screwed up in the brain. And the military uses those tactics to get the best of the best of the best for the military. You know? Um, and so, so like, when, when I didn't sleep for days, instead of somebody figuring out a way to get me to sleep, they took me to the hospital to the professionals, quote unquote. So after I had done that... In, a, in Fairfax area, I got out and I was in a day program, quote unquote day program for programming. So for three, three and a half months, I basically went five days a week for programming. And so we did fun things like art class and this and that, whatever. But, and you know, you sit around in groups and like basically pass out, trying not to, not to, not to fall asleep. But Programming what? Like programming your brain to be yeah, able to sleep? To, to, be, to be normal and adjust to meds. 
because everybody's on different meds, you know, and they just want you to take your meds and, 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 and adjust and then get a job and be normal or whatever you want to call it. I don't know how you want to call it, but basically fit in better, I don't know, or not disrupt society. Maybe that's a better way to put it. Not be a disruption. So Although now the disruptors or whatever, they, yeah. they always talk about, you know, well, disrupting society and I, how great that is. Well, then, then I'll fit right in. But, <laughs> but one of these days if I figure it out. But, but, but what I'm getting at is like, so in, in that day program, they had people coming in and talk to us about volunteering. And so I was like, that sounds kind of cool, you know. Um, and so I decided to volunteer with, I think it's called the Northern Virginia Literacy Project or it's the Literacy Project of Northern Virginia. So um, I signed up. I went in there, I took, some, I took a workshop, I got certified to teach ESL, which is what it was called then, English for Speakers, mm -hmm. English as a Second Language is what it was called then, and um, I learned the Labach method from the, from the instructors there, which is one teaches another. There's a guy, Labach, way back in the days at some Pacific Islands, he teaches a few people to read, and he says, now you teach somebody else, and so eventually the whole island could read English and speak English, because he started it and then they teach each other. So. I learned how to teach English to other people without speaking their languages, and so, so then I started volunteering to teach a Kurdish couple from northern Iraq. I taught them in their home two nights a week for about a year and a half, um, for about two hours a time, and um, and it was volunteer. They they did not pay for it. Now they had seven kids. The kids picked up everything right away, but they're in the public school system. They're learning everything. The parents they're isolated. You know the the father he would basically hang out with his friends or other people who spoke. I think. I guess Kurdish or, you know, they probably spoke a couple languages, Arabic, but I forget exactly, but I didn't speak their language, but I'd go to their house and teach them English for a year and a half. We took a, we took Ramadan off, that was it, basically. And I was a vegan at the time, too, so it was kind of funny because they tried to feed me food. They're like, I don't eat animals. They're like, huh, okay. You know, it's like, it's like, I can't, I'm like, I can't eat that. I'll be like, I'll take it with me, and I'll take it and give it to somebody else, you know, but, but so, but it was kind of interesting. But then I kind of started thinking about that service-minded type stuff, you know, um, and then as and then as I was adjusting, I mean, I was on I was on social security disability. I don't even remember how I got on it, honestly. I don't remember how the, that process happened because there was some time lost. By the time I was in the hospital, at one point they said take these certain drugs. I did. Next thing you know, it's a month and a half later. I'm at my friend's wedding in Reston, and so I don't know what happened. But I was also ended up on uh, social security disability, so I had a lot of time. I also lived in poverty for many years. Um, but eventually I was living at my parents' house in Franklin Farms and we ended up moving to Fredericksburg, Virginia where my mom got a job as a professor at the university and so we moved down there, me, her, and my stepfather. And in Fredericksburg, I volunteered at the Arts Center which has then turned into the, the book I told you about, The Gathering of Poets with those older people. It also, I went from being a docent for two years to being the docent coordinator and as docent coordinator, I made sure the, the Arts Center was open seven days a week, that there were docents volunteering and it put me on the board of directors and so I kind of got to see that angle from you know the leadership perspective at the nonprofit, and then from that from coming to that position, I got a job part time teaching English, and then the service thing really opened up too because I'm meeting people from other countries. They're paying a minimal amount. I think the classes were like twenty five dollars for a whole semester, you know. And I mean, it was it was a very it was an environment that was more like, you know what? We don't care if you're an illegal immigrant or not. We just want you to learn English because you need it while you're here. We want to teach you English. And so I always taught beginner English. So like, I'm helping people, maybe they speak no English at all and know nobody that speaks English, so I'm helping them. And so sometimes I'd have like 10 different languages in the room, you know, but I'd speak English and I can speak some Spanish and you know, I can teach some, but they told me, you know, speak English primarily. But then that brought in the service aspect. And then what happened was, is I applied to the other company that, that was hiring for a, an adult education instructor, but then it turned into being a job coach. And that was supporting people with disabilities, working in the community. and. Um, so as a job coach, I was basically taking myself off of disability at the same time I was helping people who were working who were on disability. It was very strange. And a lot of the certifications and classes I took were teaching me about the process that I was personally going through, which the employer did not know I was going through it. I didn't tell them anything about it. Okay. So then like it turned into like a whole thing of service where I was serving people with disabilities in the community on a daily basis every which way. And you're talking intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, communication deficits, like, you know, all kinds of different barriers. And so when I was doing that, um, I trained a lot of people, um, I helped a lot of people get jobs, um, worked on different councils, and the service aspect, I started meeting people from all parts of the community, you know. Um, and I always kind of figured something was going on, but I mean, like, I couldn't really quite put my hand on it, you know. Um, 
But then I started to realize I was kind of a leader, even though I was standing at the bottom rung, I was still kind of a leader because this thing called Leadership Fredericksburg came up and I actually applied to it and Goodwill paid for my tuition. That's when I met more leaders from different organizations and they're all service leaders, you know, a lot of them. And then, and if they weren't, if they were in private industry, a lot of them donated to organizations or donated time. And then at the same time, I was living, at the same time throughout this rough area period, for three years I lived at a nonprofit garden in Fredericksburg. And it was a green space, all organic. And so um, with that, um, living there, um, that was a profound part of my life too because you know the person I was with at the time, she, she really kicked ass there. I mean, she, she did a lot of things there that I could really see and she was teaching kids and she was developing programs about you know medicinal plants and did all kinds of cool stuff. And so I started to see other community members from that too. So it was almost like I was seeing like the, 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 the disability services side, I was seeing the immigration side and the education side, I was seeing the, the horticulture side and the community involvement with like, like the more earthy people. Then I've got like, then I started working with um, the reentry council with people getting out of prisons and jails. And then there was a grant program. They asked me if I wanted to work on it. So I'd visit people pre-release from before they were let out of prison and then help them with their jobs when they get out of prison. I'd meet them the day after they got out and take them to Walmart and buy them a bunch of stuff, you know, with the grant money, like, you know, toothpaste. And, and what it did, it kind of, I started thinking, wait a minute. And I started seeing beyond the divisions, you know, and, and seeing how everything interplayed. And like I told you too, I studied anthropology and sociology. So the service aspect just started swimming all around me. I was right in the middle of it the whole time. And then all of a sudden I looked around, I was like, wait a minute, where am I? And I realized that that's all I was doing was serving everybody as best I could. And even with my art, I mean, I've told you, I've, I've given away my art my whole life until like the past year and a half. When I lost my job of 13 years last year, it killed me for about a month, maybe even, you know, it killed me. A lot of things fell apart in my life at that time, but I also gained a lot of my, my own, my heart back and my spirit back. And actually, man, I'll tell you this, man, I took myself off of the meds they put me on in 1998. And, and I told my boss about it. I was like, yeah, I'm kind of titrating down. I took 14 months to titrate off this stuff. And it's a, and it's a medicine that causes people to get diabetes and other, other bad things to happen to them. But I decided to take myself off of it. And it's actually caused a lot of rifts between a lot of people in my life. And I've basically given the middle finger to a lot of people in my life. And I think what it, it's allowed me to kind of understand who I am, who I am soberly. I had stopped pretty much drinking, stopped smoking cannabis, and now stopped the psychiatric medication. And all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute. Oh yeah, this is the world I used to live in 20 some years ago before they put me on these meds. And that's when I started to really, well that's when I started to really remember, oh yeah. And, and the other thing is too, like with the service thing, as a job coach for 12 years, I was out and about constantly in all kinds of businesses, all kinds of businesses, places where you need a clearance to get into, or schools, or cafeterias, or hotels, or retail. Like, Pretty much everything you think of, almost. I mean, and and so as I started to, to get out of this mind frame and, and as I started to refocus my mind on what am I here for, and then being in, in this job center for a year, I started to really remember too how privileged we were to come from Reston, the education we had. Um, Reston is a first in many ways, and the United States is a first in many ways, so we come from a unique time period, me and you, and, and that, little, that little window before Reston became what it is now, which is like a zoo, but when we were there, it was basically an experiment. And so we had these unique experiences, ways of life where we didn't really think about, you know, oh, you know, I'm this color and you're that color. We don't like you now. A lot of people have dealt with a lot of things that we didn't. We were so privileged and so educated and so given so much, whether it's social interactions, cultural interactions, um, financial interactions. I mean, you had some of the richest people you know, some of the poorest people were all going to school together. It was a new thing, and it was, it was pur pur purposefully done. So when I started to look around all that, and I started thinking, oh, yeah, and I have all these gifts, and intellectually, and I started to remember, oh, yeah, I used to be able to do calculus in my head and get 100 on a test, you know. And I used to be, and I started thinking, oh, yeah, and then I started, like, meeting, like, 80-year-olds who are happy to be getting a $10 an hour job. And I started saying to myself, what is wrong with this place? And then the homeless folks started coming in, and I was making friends with them. And then I had people coming in from the jail, from the, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, work release program where like they had to pay to leave the jail to go look for a job. The jail wasn't feeding them before they come in. So I was actually feeding people my food at the job center. But I was also starting to realize this is really who I am and service is what it's got to be. And, and honestly, man, like I'm still trying to figure that out, you know, and I've shared some of it with you before, but it's like 
I'm trying to figure out what kind of service exactly, but it's based upon human rights, and it's honestly based upon, I think I'm supposed to connect people. So as far as a service, I know a bunch of different people, like to bring them together somehow. And honestly, it, a jam for man, I mean, it was, dude. I mean, a bunch of knuckleheaded kids, upset, and all of a sudden, bam, here we are helping out some people. I mean, what did I know, you know? I got some spray paint in a sheet. Hey, can you do this? Sure, whatever. 